Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to week number 10 in our summer referee education webinar. Um, I'm Wayne Jackson, your SDA. I will be your moderator again this evening. Uh, we'll just breeze through the uh, quick rules of engagement for tonight. Tonight's session is going to be recorded and uh, we will have that available uh, on the uh, Washington Referee homepage under previous sessions. Uh, everyone, please mute your microphones to eliminate background noise. Please, no cameras. There may be a video or two in here, and that will help with the, um, the presentation of the videos. Uh, chat boxes. Uh, we are going to be using the chat box tonight for questions. Um, if you have any specific questions uh, address, uh, to about the presentation, we will be monitoring that. If you do have a question regarding a specific law of the game, uh, we'll get, it, get that to our panel and they will respond to that. I understand Richard has some um, polls. Uh, so again, they're anonymous. Uh, please participate in those when, when asked. And time permitting, we will answer any questions at the end. And uh, we're going to try this uh, a little bit different this week. We're going to have an exit survey. Uh, we'll put a link up in the, end of, uh, in the chat box at the end of the session, and we'd encourage you to, uh, we'd like your feedback on, a, on the session. So uh, tonight's topic is going to be teamwork. Our presenter is uh, Richard Meeks. Richard is the Executive Director of uh, South King County Soccer Referee Association and our adult rep to our Washington State Referee Committee. I like to show photos of the presenters. Uh, this is a few that I snagged from Facebook on him. And the one in the uh, lower right-hand corner is actually Richard at uh, Soccer Fest with some of the, uh, the adult representatives uh, at that uh, venue. A little bit about Richard. Uh, Richard is a current and active regional referee. He's a referee instructor. He's a referee assigner. I've already mentioned that he's the adult representative to our um, SRC uh, and that he's an executive director of South King County uh, Soccer Referee Association. In his real life, you, know, you may not know this, he works for Evergreen Health and is a compliance officer. Uh, and Evergreen, as you well know, was kind of the epicenter when the, this whole COVID thing started. Uh, so he's been, been there on the front lines uh, since almost day one. So um, enough about uh, me talking about Richard. Here is Richard and uh, Richard, I'm gonna stop sharing. The screen is gonna be yours. So thank you, sir. Great, thank you so much, Wayne, for that uh, introduction. Thank you all for uh, coming out on a Monday night to watch yet another one of our webinars. Tonight, we are gonna talk about teamwork. Um, I thought when I took this topic back in June, this would be such an easy topic to do. But then watching over the last nine weeks, all of these outstanding presenters provide you the foundation of how to be a good referee and what actually will lead you to build um, with uh, in regards to what I'll cover tonight. Um, so if you've missed any of these weeks or haven't seen these presentations, these previous presentations, please uh, take the time to go to the SRC website and uh, you can uh, look at them and enjoy them uh, at any time. So to start off with, we have many different size teams. Um, sometimes we're out there by ourselves. Um, sometimes there's two of us. Uh, hopefully we usually have a, a crew of three and every once in a while we're lucky to have uh, a team of four. So as Wayne said, I'm going to try to use some poll questions over the uh, course tonight to make sure you all stay awake. And we're going to start right off with uh, poll question number one, which do you think is my favorite color? So we've got red so far, blue, black, green. Anybody there for a yellow? Everybody take a chance here to uh, look at and uh, make your vote. Uh, can you see we got about 60 of the 76 right now, Richard, about 80%? Uh, that, that looks good to me. 
So um, based here, we have 32% uh, say green. And I will say that based on our previous uh, slide, we had 32% paying attention that green must be my favorite color since I have it in three of my four pictures here. Okay, I'm gonna start off with some concepts for us this evening. So I wanna talk about um, some ideas that hopefully in thinking this through might help you um, on your next game. And this is how I think about a referee. We are, like I said, anywhere from one to four. There's some games we may even have more than four in our crew. Um, but in that, whatever it be, one to four, um, we have responsibilities that are expected of us um, from different constituent groups. Um, what I like to tell referees, um, the head referee, is that you're kind of the CEO of that match. You're responsible for what happens out there. You're responsible for many aspects of what occurs on your pitch beyond just blowing your whistle and enforcing the laws of the game. So I'm going to say you have customers out there on your match. Um, customers are mainly going to be the spectators because they're usually the ones that are paying for um, the, the, the game to watch or their kids to play. Um, your customers are also going to be the players because they're expecting you to help them be successful on their match by making sure that you don't call the fouls against them that they commit, but the fouls that they um, can capitalize upon um, against the opposing team they want you to call. You also have the coaches who are your customer because they need to make sure they get those wins so that way they have a good uh, career uh, going forward as a coach. I'm not sure if any of you ever thought about it, but you also have a client out there. Um, they may not be physically there, but they always seem to have um, eyes and ears on the pitch, and that's your assigner. Um, they're your client because you're providing your services to them for the game in which they have assigned you to. And as, they're, as them being your client, you need to provide good services to them so that way, hopefully, they'll provide other opportunities and assignments to you in the future. Now, as you start to put these pieces together, you can kind of see between this customer and client relationship, we may have to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. And that's where I get into the performance of the game. Um, I almost bring it up to that at times, some individuals have to become actors because sometimes those of us who may be introverted or maybe a quiet voice have to use skill sets that aren't normal to us. And so we have to put on a performance through those acting skills that we gain through all these different training sessions on how to be a good official, whether that be us understanding the laws of the game and appropriately applying them or us understanding where we should be positioned on the field so that way we have the best angle to make the best call at the right time. Or us having to use a voice that we're not used to by being having to be loud. So if you think about it sometimes as opposed to you going out and refereeing a game, that you're going out and um, acting as a referee to officiate that game, maybe you'll have uh, portray more confidence in regards to how you're uh, officiating the match. Um, last but not least, um, you're the safety officer. Uh, all those players are looking to you to make sure that you're providing them a safe workplace or a safe play place. They wanna make sure that someone's out there ensuring that there aren't individuals on the field who are acting in an unsafe manner and endangering their ability to continue to play in that game or to play in a future game. So these are just some concepts that I like to share and give people the idea of thinking about a match in a different way. I will never forget that cup of coffee. Well, a couple of years ago, I was traveling when my schedule worked out on Christmas Eve. I thought the airport was gonna be 
a zoo, so I got there a couple hours early. It wasn't. It wasn't crowded at all. So for me, that means coffee. So I get, I get down into my terminal, Terminal D, and I see the sign. I get in line. And so it's my turn to order. And I was greeted with this very warm and sincere welcome. This woman said to me, hi, my name's Lily. What's your name? I said, I'm Ryan. She said, Ryan, what can I make for you today? I said, well, I, I want a grande pumpkin spice latte. She said, you want whipped cream on that, don't you? I said, yeah, yeah, I want the whipped cream. She said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. She said, I'm going to make it extra hot, load it up with whipped cream, sprinkle a little nutmeg on top. You're going to love it. I said, sounds great. She said, where are you going? I said, Cleveland. She said, are you going back to Cleveland to spend the holiday with your family? I said, yes. <laughs> At this point, I start looking around for the camera, right? I mean, I'm trying to get a latte. So I move down the line and the conversation continues. And she's funny. She's asking me questions about my family and our holiday traditions. She's laughing and I'm laughing. And she hands me my drink and says to me, Ryan, have a safe trip back to Cleveland. Go create some extraordinary memories with your family. When you come back through the Minneapolis airport, I want you to stop here and tell me all about it. <laughs> As I, I get my drink, I start walking away, and I stop and I look back at this woman, and I think to myself, you know, it's, it's Christmas Eve. Most people would rather be anywhere else in the world than serving coffee in an airport not her it was like she was meant to be there and I, I couldn't help myself I had to go back so I did I walked back and I said excuse me Lily and you know she jumps around Ryan is everything okay with the latte I said no I said the latte is perfect I just had to come back and ask you what, what is your secret to making such meaningful connections over serving coffee well she she corrected me she's Brian I'm not serving coffee I'm pouring happiness into people's lives I said, you're pouring what? She wants to be happy in her life. She wants to be around happy people. So she chooses, even on Christmas Eve, to smile, to have fun, to help people, to just be happy. You know, it's interesting, when I, when I met Lily, she would have had no way of knowing this, but I was pretty heavy in the heart and had a lot on my mind. About three months before that holiday, I got a call from mom. We got some really tough medical news about dad. Uh, and it was a terminal diagnosis, and we knew we probably weren't going to have a lot of time. So I was sitting in that airport on Christmas Eve, not in the best place in the world. I will never forget that cup of coffee. Okay, I'm sure that some of you have probably seen that before, um, but I think it does a great job of setting the stage about what we're going to talk about tonight in regards to maybe not the technical aspect of the game, although we're going to cover some of those pieces as well, but maybe a way that you can look at the game a different way in which you can provide a good performance and have your spectators and clients walk away um, on a positive note. So in that video, it really talks about, in summing it up, about not serving coffee, but pouring happiness into other people's lives. And I just ask, how do you want to be remembered um, when you walk off from that pitch? Are the coaches, players, and spectators gonna remember you because you wanted to be there? and you were fair even though they didn't agree with every call? Are you gonna be the referee that the coaches, players, and spectators are glad to see you at their next game or dread that you were assigned? So whether you're a team of one or a team of four, you have to play your part so that way people view what you're doing on the pitch as something positive and beneficial and as a good official. And hopefully tonight, I'll give you some 
uh, techniques in which you can work with the rest of your team members to be able to polish the product that you have that our past presenters over the last nine weeks have given you those technical skills to be able to officiate the games in a very effective manner. So what is teamwork? This is the definition of teamwork. Individuals achieving a common goal or to complete a task. I think it's interesting in this concept about a group of independent individuals who work together towards that common goal. So many of us show up to a pitch and meet our teammates for the first time. Some of us show up to a pitch and we get to work with individuals that we enjoy working with and have gotten to officiate time and time again. Sometimes we get to show up to a pitch with ourselves and we get to be a team of one and hopefully we get along with our team of one and that way we can officiate a good game for the players. So poll question number two. Here's question number two. Are you getting it? Okay. Right. So when do you make your first impression? Answer one of those uh, four questions for us. Okay, we got about 86% of you that have uh, voted. Um, and I uh, am very happy that even with my misspelling, um, the answer is when you get out of your car. Um, that is the time that you don't know who's watching you from that moment to when you get to the pitch. So if you get out of your car and you're disorganized, not looking professional, um, you've already made an impression, whether it be on the coach, the players who are still getting to their um, field, or the spectators, um, you are making that first impression at that moment in time. Okay, so I want to start off with what some of the things that you have control over when you show up to the pitch. So as I said, when you step out of the car, appearance is something that you control. You having a professional uniform that's tucked in with, e with uh, equipment that looks polished and is professional. Your professionalism as you get to the pitch and interact with your crew, um, the coaches, and the players you have that responsibility and can shape your professionalism. And fitness. Fitness is an important aspect of your appearance. If you look the part, they'll think you are the part. So fitness is an important aspect to be able to uh, show to the coaches and spectators and players that you're there and ready to officiate their game. So, in looking at this picture, if you guys would use chat, let me know some of the uh, thoughts that you have in regards to this referee and how he's interacting with these players. Palm, I like that one. It looks like those players there are um, pretty uh, uh, excited. Something's happened recently. Um, he's listening. Um, uh, taking what they have to say. He's not confrontational. He's got his hands behind his back, which has um, given him that open communication stance, um, providing to those players that he's willing to listen um, and not closing himself off by um, having his hands across the front of him. So that's some great um, comments that you guys had there during the, in the chat. So as you can see, there's many things here that this referee 
in this situation is using to de-escalate the players that have come up to him. And there's many nonverbal skills as well as verbal skills that this referee could have used that could have escalated those players. So what's some keys to success in regards to officiating your games? So making sure that you know the laws of the game. Understand the player environment and the expectations. Um, that's an item that you should discuss with your teammates when you get there, um, as well as the several other ones. Um, making sure you have a good impression and setting the right tone. Having a professional demeanor as we've talked about before. So what are some typical pregame instructions from the referee that you've received in the past? And as the poll question gets up on the screen for you, um, I think this one you can actually do have multiple answers. So right now we've got make me look good as the uh, number one pregame that uh, officials get from their referee. I think it's actually number four, Richard. Oh, oh no, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Oh, no, I think you're right. Uh, the 82% on make sharp signals and always run to the corner flag. Right. Yep, you're right, Wayne. Thank you. Well, perfect. I'm going to go through now uh, what is a good pregame. So make sure you're covering the local rules of competition. As we all know, we ref many different leagues, many different levels, and it's always good to go through what are those local rules of the competition that we're about to step on the pitch with. Discuss any team tap, tack, tactics that we know about. Probably somebody from the crew has seen a team before or may have, the team may have a rep, reputation or maybe the club has a reputation about what their tactics are on the field. So that's good information to share. Styles of play. I'm sure all of us know Pac Northwest likes to play out of the back. Um, so we gotta be careful in regards to restarts back there. Um, I know there's several clubs that like to just boot the ball to the other side of the field. And so that's good to know so the referee knows they better get running quick. Player characteristics. If we have good team information, who's the playmaker, who's the enforcer, and who is a leader that we may be able to utilize during that game to help calm down situations or players. And talk about any other additional issues that we may think is relevant to the game. What else do you guys think need to be covered in the pregame? If you would just type your items into the group chat, that'd be great. Arrival time, so communicating with your crew prior to the match to making sure you know what time you want them there. So I see a lot of good, uh, field characteristics is a good one. Um, whether we're gonna be on grass or uh, turf, what color shirts we may need to uh, bring. So I see a lot of good um, items here in regards to uh, even items that we should talk about before we get to the field. Sharing a pre-written one. What the previous uh, results are for the contest if the two teams have played together and or maybe what the standings are in the league. Those are all some great ideas there. So next I'm going to talk about some pre-game conference ideas that you may want to discuss with your ARs. You probably want to go over offside in regards to when you want them to be raising their flag and when you may not want them to raise their flag. Talk about goal line decisions, reminding them about if the ball quickly goes over the line and back over again, what the mechanics are, so that way that can be communicated effectively to the center referee. Uh, ball in and out. Talk about game critical decisions 
and how you want them to be involved if, if you're, as the referee, aren't um, seeing those game critical decisions. Talk about how to handle incidents off the ball, um, whether or not to handle themselves or maybe uh, engage the referee to handle. What about fouls that happen outside the referee's view? Um, how those should be handled consistently. Talk about how to communicate during the game, how to handle mass confrontation and the technical area. And then dissent. Um, how much dissent um, is, is, is tolerable or that the referee will allow um, and what isn't allowable. So here's some good topics in which uh, could be covered during that pregame amongst the uh, ARs and the center referee. I stole some slides from um, Wayne's presentation a couple of weeks ago that I think does a great job of illustrating and help facilitate the conversation between the referee and the ARs and talking about the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone. And I think um, all ARs should feel empowered to act when uh, issues occur in that green zone. And that's why we have ARs on our matches. So it's important that with an AR being empowered to act, that they are calling things that are consistent with the referee. They recognize advantage in order not to upset the players if they have that. Um, and then to make sure that they're recognizing the priorities in which they should be um, making decisions within the game of that offsides is your primary responsibility, in and out is your second responsibility, and then watching the field of play. Um, also think that um, in regards to green, yellow, and red, that helps you make decisions in regards to your involvement as an AR, in regards to items that happen um, behind the referee's back, um, and those that are game critical decisions. Um, when you get into that yellow zone, um, you better make sure that you have a good credible position in which you're making that call. So when someone punches another player directly behind the referee's back and you're in that yellow zone and you're the only one that can see it, you're the one that's got to act and be able to bring that information to the referee because you have the better position and view of what has occurred. The referee needs your help because their back is to what, is, what has happened. Um, and the AR saw that and that with 100% certainty that it occurred. And the red zone is an area in which you have um, less involvement as an AR um, because usually in the red zone, as you can see, a majority of that red zone will be covered by your um, colleague, your other AR on the other side, um, and or um, the other side of your half of the field where the referee should be positioning well to see those decisions. But in the red zone, if you have a game critical decision, that is where you need to get the referee's attention. Um, something that is very serious and obvious it's gonna save your team and keep the credibility of the referee team on that pitch. And again, it's something that you have to have 100% certainty that you saw occur, not that you just think what happened. Um, so a good example is that is you have two players that maybe are in somewhat of a confrontation. One player falls down, which you're not quite sure why they fell down. That's probably not um, a, a, a situation in which you want to raise your flag. That's probably a situation in which you can provide information to the referee if they ask, but from your point of view, you're not actually able to see why that player went down. So we'll move to poll question number four and see if, uh, Jim, you can put it up on the screen for us. Um, what is the fourth official's primary responsibility? Okay, we got 
a little over half of you who've uh, answered. Anybody else got a guess there? Well, I'm gonna make sure I get a list of all who participated tonight because I think getting the referee water is a very important one because I usually am thirsty by the time I get to halftime. But I appreciate that all of you did choose the right one, which is the technical area. Uh, it's important that the fourth responsibility is to take care of that technical area since you don't, the fourth official doesn't have to carry the whistle or the flags to be able to communicate or signal uh, decisions. So here's some items that you should cover during your um, pre-game with the, with, when you have a fourth official. So substitutions is another one that should be discussed during um, with your ARs in regards to those mechanics. Um, but definitely as the fourth official, um, how their involvement needs to help facilitate that important process. Technical areas in regards to the expectations of how they handle the technical areas. Um, the fourth official should hopefully be able to diffuse issues that come from the technical areas and keep those technical areas nice and cleaned up and to help facilitate that substitution process. Again, they also need to be involved with game critical decisions in regards to what they can see and provide information to the rest of the crew. As well as watching for incidents off the ball, just like the ARs. Fourth official just doesn't get to sit over on the technical, between the technical areas and shoot the breeze with the um, uh, uh, other coaches or managers or any of the sports staffs there for trainers. Again, watching for the fouls that are out of the referee's view. Keeping that communication with the rest of the crew and handling mass confrontation if that's to occur in your match. And then finally, dissent. Um, how to handle the dissent from the technical areas and in regards to what, at what point does it, and what type of actions would require the referee to be involved uh, in dissent. And when you're on your one person crew, I encourage you to cover all the areas that we just went through in your pregame to be able to make sure that you have the right frame of mind as you go out onto the pitch and have the responsibility of being the referee, the ARs, as well as the fourth official. So I wanna talk a little bit about positioning because this is a question that comes up in regards to um, what, how should I position when I'm a one person uh, uh, crew or a two person crew? Um, and as you can see from this diagram, a three person crew. Um, I encourage referees to continue to use the diagonal uh, method of positioning no matter how many people you have in your crew. Following this positioning helps you maintain that position no matter how many people you have and you're always going to know by always using this diagonal um, where you need to be to make the right decisions. Now, with that being said, if you have only one AR, I can understand why you may spend more time on this part of the diagonal um, than maybe on this part of the diagonal. Or maybe you'll spend more time on this side as opposed to getting that far with knowing that the AR has a viewpoint here. But again, I still encourage you to stick to the diagonal because those people who do a lot of single games potentially start to pick up bad habits by not sticking to that diagonal. And then when they have a three person crew, they don't utilize the other two people on their crew to be able to be effective on the pitch. 
So now we're gonna get into poll question number five. And as Jim puts that up, um, what I wanna know is how should you, how should the ref team handle mass confrontation? I got you five different options. Okay, fantastic. Most everybody out there is uh, getting the triangle of control. So mass confrontation is um, an area in which as a team, we need to make sure that we cover during the pregame as we have um, said previously um, in this presentation. Um, gonna play a video here, um, kind of set the stage a little bit for us to be able to discuss. <laughs> Okay, so in looking at this video, what is one item that's happened here that isn't consistent with the advice that I've provided throughout the presentation so far? Go ahead and type your answers into the chat box. Okay, I see Philippe is getting his pizza. Oh, where is AR2? Yes, we have AR2 over there, but I'm not sure that his appearance is evident that he is fulfilling that responsibility out on the pitch. Um, he actually looks like the, he's a member of one of the teams out there. So let's talk a little bit about mass confrontation. Uh, mass confrontation occurs usually when you have three or more players in total. You have some type of aggressive behavior whether that be intimidation, physical contact, um, and potential for misconduct. I think in that clip, um, we had a couple different things occur in that um, time frame. We had a, a player that looks like there was some contact, there could have been some embellishment um, when that player didn't get the call that they wanted. We had another player come through and retaliate and I think the um, referee in all the best that he could do was trying to keep the ball playing down the field on an attack so that way he wouldn't have to address those two items. Um, what do you think that once we did have players falling to the ground um, what would you say type your answers into the chat that this referee team could have done better on? So maybe blow the whistle a little bit more, try to be able to get some uh, attention there. Um, I think also he's over there talking to the AR, but yet they really hadn't um, gotten control of the situation. Um, I would say they didn't use the triangle of control method. Um, I didn't even see where AR1 was or if AR1 even tried to get close to the play to be able to assist his other two crewmates. Um, so that behavior can be directed towards officials and or players. Um, and we have to intervene and diffuse the situation quickly to be able to avoid further escalation. Now, AR2, um, although I think I probably would have liked to have seen him come onto the field um, and the center referee maybe be a little bit more aggressive in regards to trying to stop what was occurring on the pitch, um, with AR2 staying on the touchline and the referee going to the touchline to talk to him. And I think he did a halfway decent job of keeping his eyes on the field, although we've already missed a couple things that's happened. 
um, that kind of created that barrier, artificial barrier between the players and the, the, the ref crew to be able to say, hey, um, you know, we're, we're trying to handle this and figure it out. Um, but I think really that type of behavior needs to occur once you have the situation stopped. And I'm not sure this referee crew did a good job of stopping the confrontation that was occurring um, on the field. I think that if the ref would have called that first foul and or embellishment of a foul, um, I think this would have turned out a whole different way. It's in the middle of the field. You're not gonna lose anything by calling that, that fall to the ground. So here's a good example of triangle of control. Um, when you're in that, it's important that you've covered this in your pregame so that you're prepared. Um, I think our video showed how they didn't recognize it so they're unable to act quickly. The triangle control didn't occur. Um, it looks like AR2 was trying to keep track of who did what. Um, I think we definitely have some misconducts here um, to be able to diffuse the situation. Um, anytime you have a, mis a mass confrontation, you better have a really good reason of why you're not providing misconducts as opposed to a really good reason of why you did. Those misconducts, this is a good time to use them to be able to lower the temperature of the match. Um, make sure then uh, as you get things under control again, get that game going. Um, and that way people can be paying attention to what's happening in the game instead of potentially escalating um, the situation more. And then make sure you have those details in your game report. So in poll question number six, we have, what should you do during halftime in regards to your crew? So here's some different items that you can choose from once we get our um, poll question up. We got just a little over half of you um, that have responded. I think this is a multiple uh, answer one as well. So I think we're getting the, the right answer there, uh, making sure that we're conferencing with our teams. I know some of us assigners um, also appreciate you checking your, your text messages. Um, so that way you can see what games we may need you to cover uh, when you get done or issues um, that are coming up on your next game um, on the weekends. So I think it's important that we make sure that the whole crew is on the same page. How many goals do we have and if, if important, who scored them? What misconduct has been given? And what numbers do we have? So that way we don't leave our center referee the opportunity to give a third yellow card. Um, what misconducts maybe should we have given um, during that first half? Is there a, an opportunity that we may want to issue one early on in the second half based on how the game's going? So discuss about what adjustments need to be made um, for the second half so that way you can land the plane. Um, discuss communication. Is everybody getting what they need from each other uh, during the game? Making sure you understand your expectations as the AR or does the center referee want to provide new expect expectations for the second half based on the first half is gone? And then talk about any potential situations that are occurring. This is definitely the time where your two AR should be exchanging information in regards to offsides and what's occurring with certain players as well as is there any particular player matchups that are occurring on the field that could potentially cause us problems in the second half? So those are some good ideas that you should talk about in regards to the um, halftime conference. So here's question seven. Um, what should you do when you blow the whistle? Okay, here comes the poll question. So after the game, what are the, should be done?
So that's fantastic. Make sure that we shake hands with coaches and players once we're uh, beyond COVID-19 and are back into a uh, uh, environment in which that's acceptable again. Um, but again, we need to have that conference with our team. Um, talk about Uh, make sure that we have the goal scores, what misconduct was issued, fill out those game sheets and appropriately provide them to the teams, and make sure we give back the player cards and we're not taking those with us to our next game. So that way uh, we have people trying to track them down in the next 24 hours. And it's important that you reflect upon your performance, whether you do this individually or with your team as a group. Um, talk about, were we able to get the, the big decisions correct? Um, were there situations that we should review and talk about? Is there feedback that the ARs have for the center in regards to his performance, or maybe the center to the ARs in regards to something they could have done that would have made his game go, his or her game go easier. So make sure we have that open communication amongst all the team members and discuss what potential changes would have made the match better because that will help you make your next match uh, better. So poll question number eight is, who's the best assigner? So I put this poll question in here because it's important that as you want to continue on your path as a referee, these are the one individuals that you need to know. They're going to get you into the different venues of soccer at the different levels and can connect you with the right people to get those assignments. So if you don't know all six of these individuals, that's something you should be reaching out to and making sure at the next state event, um, when we're all together, that you're meeting them. So for some final thoughts, um, you are the third team on the pitch. And so make sure that we've done our work, even though sometimes we're meeting our team members for the first time, so that way it looks like it's the hundredth time that we've worked together. Uh, and lack of communication leads to poor performance. I think uh, some of the, uh, what I get the most complaint about from referees is that they didn't feel that their center referee didn't provide a thorough pregame, which led to a poor performance. And I think it's important that whether we be the referee or the AR, if we don't think we're having the right pregame, we need to be asking those questions to make sure we're all on the same page. So that way, as a team, we have a good performance. And to wrap it up, again, think back. Are you just pouring coffee or are you just refing a game? and make sure that you're the referee, that when you walk onto the pitch, the players and the coaches are glad it's you and aren't making grunt noises because it's you. So thank you everyone for uh, spending your evening with me. And okay, great, great job, Richard. Can you go ahead and uh, quit sharing? Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that kind of came up and I've been kind of monitoring these. Um, and I'm gonna direct uh, um, both of these uh, really to the panel. Uh, the first one deals with kind of a minor nuance, the, uh, um, the difference between uh, just kind of an emotional reaction to a call versus uh, actual dissent. So maybe Concho or Philippe or Mo or one of you guys can uh, tackle that one and if you will answer that for the team, that would be great. Because I, I asked that question, maybe I just share a couple of words about that. This is emotional game and uh, throughout the game you need to be mindful that explosion will happen, that emotional explosion might happen. You have to be mindful of that. You have to anticipate that. And uh, your response in those emotional explosion should be calm and uh, do not react, you know, to even that up, 
the emotion that the players is expressing. Be calm, listen. Most important thing that you do is listening. Always seek first to understand and then be understood. When the player is emotionally responding, when they hear that you are listening, when they see that you are listening to them, without reacting right away, then they respond better when you are telling them what to do, when you are giving them your response. Generally speaking, of course, situation can be different, you know, to situation to situation can be different. But generally speaking, just be calm, do not react, control your emotion, be mindful and listen. I think that's a good answer, Mo. Um, I would also kind of uh, direct everybody to reflect back on Richard's presentation, the one slide that he showed with the referee with three people around him. Um, I think that shows that they were, you know, I, granted they were emotional, but nobody had really crossed the line where he was whipping out cars. He was listening to everybody. We have um, uh, one more thing. I, I, I'm sorry if okay, I go if ahead, I may. It is as you are, the, that, uh, that clip was very good. Always remember, remember your body language is extremely important. How you react to the situation around you, okay? Your body language is even more important than the word that you use, you know? Display proper body language and then proper word and proper tone of words. You know, and U.S. soccer has kind of the definition of the three P's when you cross a line for uh, dissent of being personal, provocative, and, um, uh, and public. So you can think of it in, in those terms as well. Um, the second question deals more, um, and I don't want to get too long on this one, uh, is how much involvement do you want to have your fourth official uh, with anything that may be going on, uh, on in your game that's happening on the field? Uh, when do you want him to involved uh, and how much involvement do you want from him? Uh, perhaps uh, Philippe or Katja, Katja, you've had, been in a lot of fourth officials. Uh, are you still on? If you are, I'd like to see, you can, see if you can feel that one. I guess Katja may Wayne. have left. So, Philippe, can you go ahead? Yes. So, the fourth official is a, a, an extra pair of eyes on the field. And so, the, the fourth official is getting involved. And someone in the chat mentioned, is there a, 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 a green, yellow, a red zone for the fourth official? It's basically the green one is everything which is nearby the halfway line, nearby the touch line. And so the force official has to make presence over there. And obviously to see what's going on behind the, the back of the referee. And so the, that would be the involvement I would ask. Obviously the force official is in charge of both technical area and has to make sure that the technical area are managed and they are in order. In or and so this will help the AR and the referee to do their job correctly. Uh, Wayne, if I can add, I think that um, as, ahead, as, as, as a fourth official, it's about building a relationship. And if you build that relationship, you know, you talked about when does responsibility start. That was one of the poll questions. And it starts when you get out the car. As a fourth official, when you build that relationship prior to the game starting and um, setting the, the line, setting an expectation of, of the behavior that's going to be there, Again, once you, once you draw that line in the sand, and it's not like a stiff line, it's just letting people know. If and when there may be problems in this game, I'm here for you to express yourself to. And once you allow that relationship to be established with both technical areas, then it allows you to help calm things down a little bit quicker when bad things happen. You know, hopefully nothing bad will happen, but if it does, start the process before it begins you know be proactive in come to me 
just in case. And then when something does, pa does happen, then your response is, remember what we talked about before the game started. And that changes the focus back to you and away from the crew on the field. Okay, uh, I think that's gonna be a wrap for this evening. Uh, Richard, uh, I thought you did an excellent job. It was a, it's a tough one to, to kind of talk and uh, articulate. I think I'm, you know, Ray gave you two thumbs up there. So I think everybody will. Um, again, we're most interested in your feedback. Please click on the, uh, the link in the chat box. Please give that to us uh, and then you're free to go. So thank you very much for joining us. Next week uh, will be uh, Philippe. Uh, that'll be our last one for August. And he's got the, um, uh, the fouls with the arms. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening.